Hi, this is Mrs. Olson. We're going to start reading part two of The Cyclops from the Odyssey. We're starting at line 232 on page 959. Neither reply nor pity came from him, but in one stride he clutched at my companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal gaping and crunching like a mountain lion, everything innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on filling up his belly with man flesh and great gulps of whey, then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along his flank to stab him where the midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside, so we were left to groan and wait for morning. When the young dawn, with fingertips of rose, lit up the world, the cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers. Then his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through. But he, behind, reset the stone as one would cap a quiver. There was a din of whistling as the cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground. Then stillness, and now I pondered how to hurt him worst, if but Athena granted what I prayed for. Here are the means I thought would serve my turn. A club or staff lay there along the fold, an olive tree, felled green and left to season for Cyclops' hand. And it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep sea-going craft might carry, so long, so big around it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pole and set it down before my men, who scraped it, and when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with pointed end. I held this to the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it, then hid it well back in the cavern under one of the dung piles in profusion there. Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in Cyclops' eye? When mild sleep had mastered him, as luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss. Four strong men and I made five as captain. At evening came the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock. The rams as well this time entered the cave by some shepherding uh, whim or a god's bidding. None were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the ble bleating ewes in proper order, put the lambs to suck, and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward, holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liqueur to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it and see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would help us home, but you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will any other traveler come to see you? He seized and drained the bowl, and it went down so fiery and smooth, he called for more. For more. Give me another, another, thank you kindly. Tell me, how are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclops know the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain. But here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him, and he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones, Cyclops, you ask my honorable name? Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is... Nobody, mother, father, and friends. Everyone calls me nobody. And he said, nobody's my meat then after I eat his friends. Others come first, there's a noble gift now. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward, his great head lolling to one side, and sleep took him like any creature, drunk, Hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of men. Now by the gods, I drove my big hand spike deep in the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along the ba with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. The pikes of olive, green though it had been, 
reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals and my four fellows gave me a hand, lugging it near the cyclops as more than natural force nerved them. Straight forward they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye, and leaned on it, turning it as if a sh as as a shipwright turns a drill in planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove. So with our brand we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the red-hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared, the pierced ball hissed, broiling, and the roots popped.